Hello everyone, welcome back to our medical shot videos by Tutor IMG. So we were discussing peptic ulcer disease in a previous video. I'm just going to continue that discussion. And uh, in this one, we're going to be talking about how to investigate and manage peptic ulcer disease. So when we talk about investigating peptic ulcer disease, there is a chance that the question on the wards might mention that your patient has anemia, okay? So if your patient has anemia, along with the general symptoms of peptic ulcer disease, that is a prompt or a hint which should guide you towards choosing FOBT as the next step in your investigations. Remember, usually when you're talking about peptic ulcer disease in a young, healthy patient, you do not need to choose FOBT. However, when your patient on the question that is being described as having a hemoglobin that's lower than your um, expectant value for your healthy adult, then you should choose FOBT. The next thing that you want to consider is, what is the most commonly correct answer on the boards? The most commonly correct answer is the urea breath test. Why is the urea breath test the correct investigation? Because mainly patients, it's, you know, it's easy to perform on a patient, it does not require any prior um, you know, prerequisites, you don't need to prepare your patient through any kind of fasting or anything. A simple urea breath test is a very quick way of assessing if a patient has H. pylori. So 90% of the time, when you're working with a patient who has peptic ulcer disease, and he's been described as having the classical symptoms of peptic ulcer disease, mind you, uh, without anemia, then the correct answer is a simple urea breath test. There will be chances when they ask you, or the answer choices include a blood test. When is that the correct answer? Now, a blood test is basically going to stay positive if a patient has ever had H. pylori disease. So if your patient is coming in with a first time ever presentation, in that case, you might want to do a blood test. But if the patient has a past history of peptic ulcer disease, then there's no point to giving them a blood test, okay? So blood test is not the correct answer. If your patient is a recognized prior diagnosed case of peptic ulcer disease, okay? Because just like with every other infection, once the body is used to creating antibodies against a particular pathogen, it's going to retain that memory, that record. So continuing our investigation um, discussion, endoscopy is usually, you know, the most sought after, the most sought after answer on the boards. So when do you choose endoscopy? Endoscopy is the best answer if your patient, you know, the vignette describes the patient as being over 50. Or if that's not the only clue, if you have a clue like over 50 and they're kind enough to give you a new symptom, right? Meaning the patient is over 50 and now after the age of 50 is manifesting peptic ulcer disease symptoms. It's a no brainer, choose endoscopy. And then of course the alarm symptoms, alarm symptoms like weight loss, bleeding or anemia, vomiting that is you know, new and um, accompanies every meal or is very, very disturbing along with an abdominal mass and of course dysphagia. Couple that with perhaps a family history of GI carcinoma, definitely a scary picture, you need to do endoscopy. If the patient has a failed, repeated trial of therapy, that too is a very concerning sign and endoscopy is warranted. So anytime the case vignette describes these features, but please remember age over 50, and we stress this in our lectures as well, age is a huge help, especially on the QE1 where the questions are very short, you don't have too many clues, so age over 50, should be a very big clue um, for you, you know, encouraging you to choose endoscopy on the boards. 
So choosing wisely on the QE1 um, usually means that you're not to choose endoscopy if there is absence of alarm symptoms. Okay, never choose endoscopy in the absence of alarm symptoms, but this is of course a younger patient. If your patient is over 50, then endoscopy becomes a more natural choice. And upper GI series, that's just a red herring. It's never the correct answer, right? Especially when you have a patient with dyspepsia. So um, don't choose that. Now heading towards um, treatment. So when you're doing a CDM, how are you supposed to write it? It has to be written in a sequence. The first thing that you do, the first thing that, that is necessary is H pylori testing. Why does that come first? It comes first because if you do any kind of treatment, especially a PPI, that's going to mean that you're interfering with the H pylori testing. It's going to alter your results. You don't want that, right? The simplest test, the urea breadth test for H pylori is not going to give you a good answer, an accurate answer, if you already started PPI in your patient. So pre-treating with a PPI is not the right way to go. Okay, especially not in the Canadian population where a lot of people have this particular infection, all right? So only if your general population risk is under 10% will you start a blind sort of treatment with PPI. So usually in the Canadian um, you know, um, culture here, society here, um, what we see is that this infection is pretty high, the rate of this, and we don't fall into this category anymore. So pre-treating with a PPI is, is out. Okay, so we don't do this. We need H. pylori testing first. So the best answer is um, only if the H. pylori test is negative should you start the PPI, and then you give it four weeks. If you're successful, you stop the treatment. If you fail to treat the symptoms, that is um, another reason for you to reassess the patient and maybe consider endoscopy. And when do we do that? That is when the patient is, um, you know, over 50, we are very, very concerned, right? Over 50, we are concerned. Definitely endoscopy is going to be the way to go there again. So um, continuing treatment, um, we've tested for H. pylori. It comes back positive. What are we supposed to do? PPI and Clomet. Clomet is also, basically, it's a combination of clarithromycin and amoxicillin. These treatments are given for 15 days. Do you need to know the dosages? No. This is just there because, um, well, you know, if, if you see it often enough, it might just stick. So, you know, no harm in that. But you don't really need to memorize them separately. The treatment is required for 14 days. If the patient is penicillin allergic, you obviously cannot give them amoxicillin. And that's where your quadruple therapy comes into play. Okay. Uh, which includes bismuth subsalicylate, um, metronidazole, tetracycline, and the PPI, again, for 14 days. Now, um, all other therapies, by the way, are out. They're no longer recommended. So do not choose them. It will show that you are weak in the area where you're supposed to be current with, uh, you know, with what's prevalent in family medicine here. So other treatments like the triple therapy and all of that, it's out. Um, and on, on the boards, if you don't see these two choices, what else can you choose? You can choose um, an option where it combines the amoxicillin with the levofloxacin, right? And a PPI again for 14 days. So this is again going to be a patient that's not penicillin allergic, right? So if your patient is not penicillin allergic and you don't see PPI plus Clamet, you can choose amoxicillin and levofloxacin option plus the PPI for 14 days. Now, um, is it enough to just leave your patient after giving them treatment? Usually, if our patient becomes, um, you know, happily asymptomatic, you don't need to follow them up. However, if they stay symptomatic, then a urea breath test for, um, you know, test for cure, 13, thir sorry, 30 days, not, not 13, 30 days after treatment completion, is the way to go. Why 30 days? Because we actually need the body to be rinsed off of the antibiotic we were giving the patient for about 28 days before we can allow the urea breath test to give us a reliable result. We need the bismuth that we were maybe giving the patient to be out of the system for two weeks before the urea breath test can be made useful. The PPIs need to be out of the system at least three days 
before um, the urea breath test can be done um, and you can expect a prop result. And then antacids and H2 blockers should be out of the system for 24 hours at least. If your urea breath test at this point, right, we're doing it in, of course, symptomatic patients who failed um, the treatment. So if um, the urea breath test comes back negative, then this patient can be treated as one of functional dyspepsia. All right. If the test comes back positive, then that means whatever you were giving the patient, the bug is resistant to that treatment and you need to switch to another line of therapy and perhaps give them a referral once again, especially if the age is over 50. All right, so I hope this discussion helps you on the boards because these are, these are answers to maybe, maybe all of the questions you're possibly going to get from peptic ulcer disease. Um, leave us your comments, please subscribe to the channel. Um, we really value your feedback and we are trying to improve the videos for, um, you know, based on your feedback to be of more help to you guys. Thank you very much. Subscribe and help encourage us. Thank you.